What's going on, Love Tribe? Thanks for tuning in to today's show. We appreciate you guys. And today we have Dr. Carl Pillemer, where we talk about his latest book, Fault Lines, Fractured Families and How to Mend Them. And of course, you might be asking how this relates to your relationship. And I actually wanted to have Carl on the show because of personal estrangement issues. I think most families have something going Mm -hmm. on. We're not all just perfectly functioning families. And if we have a more functioning family, then I believe we're going to have a better personal life and also better relationships. And then we talk about how to mend fractures in our families and then how our partners can come into play with that. And also, of course, we talk about issues surrounding in-laws, really a lot that we dig into today with Carl. And I found a lot of value in today's episode. And a little bit about Carl. He is the professor of human development at Cornell University. He is a world-renowned family psychologist and has spent five years studying the process of estrangement and reconciliation in families. Um, So he is basically the best, one of the best people to talk to when it comes to estrangement and reconciliation with your loved ones. Yeah. And as I said, I really found this episode valuable and we hope you guys do too. We appreciate you tuning in. Please subscribe to the podcast, tell your friends and family. We appreciate you guys doing that. That helps us grow. And as always, we have a ton of free resources on the website, including our 14-day Happy Couple Challenge, which is a email that gets sent to you for 14 days with fun, easy, doable challenges to help strengthen your relationship. So, and that's free and that's on our website. And then we also have our online course, Spark My Relationship. Um, And if you are a listener of the podcast, you can get $100 off by going to sparkmyrelationship.com forward slash unlock. So we hope you guys check it out and enjoy today's show. Before we jump into today's interview, we want to tell you about our online course, Spark My Relationship. Do you guys want to create more passion, improve your communication, and build a stronger, more intimate connection with your partner in less than 90 days? Yes. Sign me up. (laughs) Then you guys need to check out our online course, Spark My Relationship. It is an online course, like I mentioned, that we created with over 15 therapists and psychologists to bring you guys the strategies marriage therapists teach their clients. We talk about it on the show. Relationships take work. Sometimes they function pretty easily and you coast along. But we've found the reality is, is you have to do work sometimes and to make them better, to change them so that they're more satisfying for both partners. And you've made it here. You've made it to listening to our show. So you guys probably already know that a little bit. But what you might not know are the specific tools and exercises that you need to create those lasting and positive improvements in your relationship. And like Chase said, change does not happen on its own. It takes hard work. And that's why we created the course. Spark My Relationship is designed to infuse your life and relationship with fresh passion, skills, and wisdom. And it's a self-paced journey that's perfect for turning up the heat, having some fun together, and revolutionizing your intimacy and communication. And just some tools and strategies that the course includes is to how to eliminate unhelpful old habits, develop mindful awareness to help improve your stress management, learn healthy and successful communication tools, create a deeper and more intimate bond, and strengthen your couple microculture, which you will find out what that is. Uh, in the future together. So for our listeners only, we're offering a special of $100 off the course. Visit sparkmyrelationship.com slash unlock to unlock your discount. And there is a 30 day money back guarantee. So there really is no reason to not give it a try. So go to sparkmyrelationship.com slash unlock for $100 off. Hi, Carl. Thanks so much for joining us on the show today. 
Oh, well, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. In the pre-show, we talked about how fractured families tie into our personal intimate relationships. And there's a lot there to unpack, but we thought we could start in general. And because a lot of us, I know personally, uh, deal with a fractured family and your latest book, Fault Lines, Fractured Families and How to Mend Them really stuck out to me. And that's why I actually reached out to you to come on the show. I'm like, how can we mend them? Because I'm in the midst of, it's been kind of an ongoing, difficult relationship. Um, personal relationship with someone close to my family. And I feel like I'm banging my head against the wall. <laughs> and, and, and this seems to be pretty common and it's unfortunate and I want it to get better. And I know individually that'll make me feel better and it'll help me in my relationship. So why don't we start in general with where can I start if I feel like I have a fractured relationship and uh, something I want to begin to repair? Well, those are great questions. And let me begin by saying that this project that we call the Cornell Estrangement and Reconciliation Project I'm at Cornell University um, was a series of related studies trying to get at exactly those kinds of questions. Uh, you know, how do we mend a fractured family? How can we best overcome an estrangement in our own family? So I spent around five years trying to figure some of those things out. And I hope that some of the advice in the book, you know, helps other people not to have to do as much work as I did to look into it. So I hope that it's useful. You know, your thought makes me think of sort of three fundamental points that really came through in the research and that I discuss in the book. One is that people in family estrangements often feel very much alone. Uh, people told me that they really don't talk to other people about it, that it's a shameful experience. They feel that their family is the weirdest in the world to have this. And what I learned from my studies is, first of all, how common estrangement in families is. So I found that over a quarter of Americans report currently being estranged um, from a relative. So people who are in this situation aren't alone. 27% uh, of the population in a national study I did is experiencing an estrangement. So it's a common problem. And one of my biggest goals is to take this problem of estrangement out of the shadows and into the clear light of open discussion, really a situation where people can can process this more openly and share it with other people. So that was one key thing. One of the most important things that I feel that the research I've done and that comes out in fault lines is interviewing over a hundred people who had reconciled in their own families. And that's something that had never been done before, that people were interviewed in depth who had successfully accomplished this kind of reconciliation. So the first thing I learned was how widespread this is. And the second thing I learned is that people can, through effort, through goodwill, through almost a disciplined approach, overcome these estrangements in their own families. So it's very widespread, but there also are ways to approach it and ways to mend your own fractured family. So like I haven't really gotten to your, your core question as to what to do, which I could turn to now. Would that be a good thing? Yeah. Yes. So that's exactly what I was going to say. The effort and the goodwill. Tell us a little bit about what you found by interviewing those families. And I know I feel like I'm putting some effort in and my goodwill sometimes feels a bit exhausted and maybe people out there can relate. So, so how can we start this process? Sure. So let's, so one question of which many people like you have, first of all, is why reconcile? Why should we continue to pursue these sometimes troubling or difficult family relationships? And clearly if they're dangerous or abusive, people may not want to, but most of them aren't. Most of them are the result of interpersonal difficulties. So a reason why people should give it a try is that individuals who reconcile 
generally found it to be an immensely positive experience in their lives. That trying to do this, trying to overcome the estrangement, was a powerful engine for personal growth. And many of them found that, as one woman told me, if I could do this, I could do anything. So there was a broad, positive sense of at least trying as hard as one could. Also, people gain some specific things. You may gain access to family members or resources that you might not otherwise have. And people generally felt that if they overcame an estrangement, it was a huge weight off their shoulders. They felt that they no longer were worried if the other person might die, for example. They would uh, have horrible regrets. They, that very often they felt that this estrangement was sort of a cloud over their head. One man who reconciled with his brother told me, this is the first time in 25 years that it's not in the back of my mind that, that I haven't talked to my brother in 25 years. So one thing I did learn is it's a positive experience for many people who can go through it. I asked folks who had reconciled and people's in estrangement, so I asked hundreds of people what worked and what didn't for overcoming the rift. And there were a number of specific lessons and pieces of advice, but there are two or three that were critically important. One of the most important pieces was accepting that your different views of the past won't line up, that it's almost impossible to get someone else to accept your view of the past. So a brother who thinks that he was only doing harmless teasing is almost never going to get his adult sister to feel anything other than that he was emotionally abusive towards her. A parent who felt that um, he was trying to protect his son against a bad marriage, that's not going to align with his son's view that his father was trying to interfere, it was trying to interfere with his only choice for happiness. So one of the main things people who reconcile say, you have to give up this focus on the past and focus on the present and the future, looking for what's there now and what the future could hold. Because People in estrangements have strong narratives about what went on, and they don't give them up easy, um, easily. Um, a second piece of advice is to really focus on and understand your own role and responsibility in it. Even if you decide that you weren't at fault to any degree, truly examining the history of the relationship and how the individual, you, you know, you, you, everybody, not just you personally, Chase how you might have acted differently, how you might have acted in ways that you could later regret. It's not so much to apologize to the person as to understand your own sort of powerful role in it, because usually these are the roles of two people. And third was the ability to set boundaries after the relationship begins. One of the major discoveries I made is what keeps people in estrangement often isn't anger or hostility, it's anxiety. You're worried about being drawn into the same family relationship again. Um, and my hundreds of interviewees told me that you need to create a protected space for yourself, sometimes with the help of a counselor or with friends or other people that lets you re-enter the relationship um, and not be absorbed. So I would say those are three key pieces that folks, you know, learn to give up having the other person accept their view of what went on in the past, they were able to understand their own role to the degree that there was one. And often with help, they created healthy boundaries that allowed themselves to re-enter into the relationship. Those are three amazing things to think about, and I'm scribbling away. And I want to ask you, how can we start that conversation? So let's say, we're not even talking to an estranged family member or just the the relationship is very strained. So it's an occasional text or discussion, but there's just a lot of tension there. And we've decided we don't want to do that anymore and we want to repair this relationship. What can that first conversation look like and sound like to get things rolling? That is a terrific question. And let me say... 
you know, I don't want to be entirely rosy about this. One of the things that does sometimes happen in estrangements is, is a complete stonewalling, where really it's as if someone has built a stone wall and all attempts at contact are rejected, even after years or decades. And what the people who reconciled told me, and it's not an easy thing, is that in a situation where someone won't respond at all, continuing to keep the door open, continuing to make contact, continuing to sometimes make contact through other family members, they argued that it's worth it to, as they put it, keep the door open. And sometimes for some people in really intransigent estrangements, keeping the door open is almost all that can be done, expressing a willingness, the fact that one is there. And I have seen after decades, the other person sometimes comes around. If it's not a stonewalling situation, folks in estrangement argue that if you're going to make that first overture, um, well, let's say there's been a situation where someone has allowed you to friend him or her on Facebook, or there have been family emails that were not hostile. You have some sense that there's a chance that of an opening into this relationship. One of the things they argue is to plan very carefully. Really think out how you will approach it, what you will say, what you will do if you're rejected. Um, and sometimes talking to a counselor before making an overture can help. Uh, that it really helps to think how you're going to approach it, how you will deal with, you know, a negative outcome. That kind of a rehearsal is really helpful for people. Then people approach the other person in many different ways. One common thing was to engage around a non-controversial issue, uh, you know, um, sending an email they felt the person might be interested in, or again, the inclusion of someone on an email or, or contact through social media. Um, so that's another key piece. And finally, one thing which the people who reconciled argued, and I think it relates to your question, is to pretty much abandon the idea that a reconciliation is contingent on an apology. Very often when people in estrangements say they want an apology, it's not for one thing the other person did. It's for the entire person that this this individual was or to apologize for an entire childhood. And that's just not going to happen. So going into a reconciliation attempt with demands for an apology or to really understand what went on is very unlikely. So sometimes casual contact helps at first. uh, And also. Not an apology, but the ability to explain to someone else that you understand what your role in the estrangement was, that you are accepting, as one of my respondents said, you're 100% responsible for 50% of the relationship. That can be very reassuring to someone who, in whose life you're trying to get back into. What if the person who is trying to reconcile with is kind of unaware of their behavior traits or just the the broader situation of why there is that tension in the relationship? So, for example, if Chase then goes into trying to fix a relationship with somebody, but they're unaware that there are really those issues or doesn't fully understand that, how does that communication process go? And would it be taken differently than if there is more of a situation that needs to be talked about and resolved? You raise a very interesting point. You know, this point is an important one, is what if someone else is unaware of the relationship difficulties they're causing, or is blithely forging ahead in one way or another causing problems maybe in the family or with others and just doesn't know about it. One key point there is whether you have a sense that there's any receptivity to talking about the relationship itself. Sometimes parents and children expect to do that. It's somewhat less common among siblings or grandparents and grandchildren. So it's sometimes a little non-normative to try to process the relationship. Uh, But one first step is if it's the right situation and the other individual is willing to talk about it, 
that can really lead to some breakthroughs in the relationship. If that's not possible, um, and let me give an example. One uh, prominent cause for estrangement I found is around family caregiving situations. A daughter, let's say, is the primary caregiver for her older parents. She expects brother Tom, let's call him, to be coming and helping. Tom has no such expectations. He just doesn't think he's good at it. He finds it stressful and he stays away and maybe just comes to visit occasionally. That he's not necessarily aware of what he's doing wrong. He just sees it as the way he is. Many people tried to change the other person in those situations. And over and over, they told me that you've got a choice, especially among adults. And that's whether to accept the person as he or she is. That is, can you accept him, let's say, for the person that as an adult he is right now? Because honestly, people do change, but as I'm sure you found in your, your work with married couples, people don't change because we want them to. Over and over, another principle for overcoming an estrangement was let go of your expectations or lower them um, uh, realistically. Expecting this sibling to perform responsibly or not to make you know, irritating political comments is often unrealistic. So a lot of the people who overcame an estrangement gave up trying to change the other person. Uh, and another principle which they offer that I thought was very interesting is they said, if you want to reconcile, ask yourself, what's the least I can accept? What is the least acceptable return on investment into this relationship? Think from that standpoint if you're going to redo it. So if somebody's not particularly rewarding or not particularly helpful when they should be, can you accept them? Um, I learned, for example, parents who were estranged from their adult children had to make a decision in reconciliation. Often the adult child would make demands or restrictions, like, I'm willing to be back in this relationship with you, but you can't ever stay in my house. You know, we'll see each other a couple times a year, and my new stepfather can't come at all because I don't like it. That, that's an example of sort of a real case. The person has to decide what's the least I can accept. And very often, people found it was worth it to accept that very limited, you know, those limited um, rewards. So I think there would be those, you know, to sum up, one is if you can talk to the person about the content of the relationship itself in some safe context, they would recommend doing it. And otherwise, you have to decide for yourself whether the limited benefits of being in contact um, outweigh the you know costs and the difficulties. Before we continue on, let's take a break to talk about today's sponsors. Today's episode is brought to you by Uberloop. Uberloop offers long-lasting performance when you want it, then quickly dissipates without leaving a sticky residue. It feels like a nice moisturizer when you're finished. Many people, including myself, often used to say that I never knew lube could be this good. I love the way it makes my body feel, and there's no need to really wash it off. Uber Lube is a high-grade silicone lubricant made from clean, body-friendly ingredients. It's just silicone with a little vitamin E. The vitamin E leaves a velvety finish that actually moisturize the skin. And I love the feeling when I'm done using it because I'm in the sun all the time and my skin is usually pretty dry. Uber Lube has no flavor or scent and it's completely body safe because it's free from all those nasty additives like parabens, preservatives, and petrochemicals. I don't even know what that is, but it doesn't sound good and I definitely do not want it on my skin. It stays on the surface of your skin and does not enter your bloodstream like all the other water-based lubes. Right now, they're offering I Do Podcast listeners a special offer. 10% off and free shipping when you use our code I do at uberlube.com. That's 10% off and free shipping. Be sure to use our code I do at U B E R L U B E 
Com. Today's episode is also brought to you by Function of Beauty. Function of Beauty is the world's first fully customizable hair care brand that allows you to create shampoos, conditioners, styling, and treatment products based on your hair needs, your hair goals, and your aesthetic preferences. There are over 54 trillion possible ingredient combinations to make sure your formula is as unique as you. One size fits all may work for your accessories, but when it comes to your hair care products, we all need something a little different to help us look our best. So here's how it works. You take a quick but thorough quiz where you tell them all about your hair. Next, the Function of Beauty team will determine the right blend of ingredients, bottle up your custom formula to order, then they deliver your personalized formula right to your door in a cute customized bottle with your favorite color and fragrance. They even print your name on it. It is so cute. So now when Chase tries to use my shampoo because it smells so nice, I can tell him to back off because it has my name on it. All of their formulas are vegan and cruelty-free. They never use sulfates, parabens, or any other harmful products. Function of Beauty is not just the first ever custom hair care brand. It's the internet's top-rated custom hair care brand with over 40,000 real five-star reviews and counting. So what are you waiting for? Go to functionofbeauty.com slash I do to take your four-part hair profile quiz and save 20% on your first order. Go to functionofbeauty.com slash I do for 20% off and let them know you heard about it from our show. That's functionofbeauty.com slash I do. A lot of great stuff in there, Carl, and we could spend several episodes just on repairing our fractured families and and reaching out to those family members. But we want to tie this now into if we're in a partnership, so if we're married or, or just in a relationship, how can we either ask for support or support a partner who's trying to do this. And then maybe there's also examples where a partner is exasperating a fracture um, in a negative way. Can you tell us a little bit about that? In fault lines in the book, I was able to determine six common pathways to estrangement. So I don't call them causes because whoever decides exactly how estrangements are causes are caused deserves a Nobel Prize. But I was able to identify common pathways. And one very common pathway is what I call the problematic in-law. A surprising number, or perhaps not surprising for folks who do the kind of work you do, number of estrangements are due to someone in the eyes of their family of origin marrying the wrong person. Now, we tend to think of this as parents reacting to a child's choice of a partner. But we actually found that with rising rates of divorce in the older population, a parent's remarriage was also a significant cause in in some cases of family stress um, and led to estrangements. So often people are placed in a dilemma between their family of origin and the family that results from marriage. And in some cases, the new in-law simply can't get along with the family. There are even more extreme cases where the in-law doesn't like the family, like so the new husband or wife, and actually works to isolate the person from their family and makes it difficult uh, um, for them to be in touch. And that's uh, that really is an all-too-common pattern of in-law relationships leading to estrangement. And sometimes those estrangements don't resolve until the marriage dissolves in some cases. So people were, however, able to overcome it. And a few of the pieces of advice in this situation for couples, I would say, are as follows. One is, and this may not resonate to modern day couples, but many of the people I've interviewed both for this study And for people in studies, I've also done studies of people in long marriages, and they say the same thing. You really have to consider whether you can get along with someone's family as part of the commitment process. Many marriages are made extraordinarily difficult 
because of family opposition to the marriage or of difficulty getting along. No one's saying that you shouldn't get married for that reason, but at least if you really dislike your future partner's family, you have to prepare for that as an ongoing stress in the relationship. And sometimes that stress does lead to estrangement. So that is one issue. And the problem is that people don't perceive in-laws as family. Um, But one of my interviewees said, the problem is, you know, they're not you and, and they're not your family. So I would say that one piece of advice for people is to realize that in-law relationships are potentially difficult. A stress and a tension can occur between your married family and your family of origin that can lead to estrangements if it becomes uh, uh, too difficult. And, and I think that that's not so much a piece of advice as it's a, you know, as it's an awareness um, of what occurs. So in some ways, these spousal relationships can be difficult. I will say that the number one piece of advice, both from fault lines, from my work on estrangement, and from my studies of long marriages is this. In a battle between the, your own, you know, the family you grew up in, the family of origin, and the marriage Um, And the marriage partnership, uh, the family of origin is almost always going to lose out. Any parent who lays down the line and says, it's your wife or me, almost invariably loses out. So drawing that kind of line in the sand around a partner really doesn't make any sense uh, if you want to maintain the relationship. And I did see this again and again in families of strain, where parents and children were estranged. You know, the parent drew that line in the sand. I don't approve of this person for personality reasons, uh, um, uh, racial or ethnic reasons, or religious reasons. And they almost invariably regretted those decisions because they were very hard to repair. Now, on the positive side, I encountered a number of situations where spouses were very helpful with a reconciliation, uh, where spouses came in and said, you know, I think that our kids need to at least have some contact with their grandparents on your side. Or I think you would feel better if you at least attempted a reconciliation with your parents or with your brother. So sometimes partners really help to facilitate um, a reconciliation. In some cases, you mentioned, what do you do when you make that first phone call? In some cases, people would have their spouse next to them when they made calls to, say, a difficult parent. And that spouse could help them decide when it was time to stop talking or when it was time to try again. They often provided a buffer of, you know, between the person from whom the individual was estranged. So I found that both married partners can cause problems and difficulties, but they can also be critically important um, sources of support for people who are trying to reconcile. And finally, I will say, there's something else I learned about family estrangement stuff, that they almost never affect just the two people involved. So I include a full chapter on what I call collateral damage. These estrangements ripple out into the whole family. So I've seen them up close and personal where a spouse is having real difficulties with her siblings around the care of a parent. And her husband hears about this every night. Uh, You know, each day it's, okay, so what did they do today? This causes a contagion of stress in marriages that can be very difficult. So couples just need to be aware that an ongoing and difficult estrangement has these kind of contagious effects and can affect the relationship of the couple too. And it may lead to them, you know, having to work some things out in their own relationship. Carl, there's so much in there uh, that you've given us and our listeners. Uh, I know for me, this is really valuable. And before we let you go, I have one more specific instance from a personal experience 
and then uh, we'll wrap up here. And you've mentioned this situation, but let's say there's a parent whose kid is in a relationship that they don't approve of their partner. And I say approve of, that can mean like not even drastically, but just to go, I, I think my kid deserves someone better. And Sarah and I have a daughter who's only five, but one day I can imagine this situation, even when she gets her first boyfriend, <laughs> if he's a, if he's a little troublemaker, I'm going to you know, not. <laughs> not feel great about that. But let's talk about adult kids and that situation where a parent doesn't approve, even, you know, think that this person is right for their kid. And they, they tell their kid, because I, I feel like I would want to tell my kid, not in a judgmental way and not if it wasn't something drastic, but they, they tell them, how can they tell them and voice their concerns and how can that not become an issue? Because obviously there's not a simple answer here and it's touchy, but this is a, a selfishly a personal experience that I want to help out my mom <laughs> with. <laughs> it's not in relation to Sarah, to be clear. It's actually... Uh, my my sister, who doesn't listen, so fire away. <laughs> that is a really great question. And this situation that parents do encounter of, it's the old-fashioned way to say, sort of not approving of a relationship. Well, so let's make some distinctions there. A parent who perceives that a relationship is actually abusive or that the relationship is dangerous, which of course is a very small minority of relationships, has a particular dilemma. They clearly have a responsibility, and I think almost all experts would agree, to try to warn their offspring about it, to, uh, you know, to counsel them about it, but almost never is it a worthwhile strategy to cut the child off. Indeed, you probably want to stay closer and stay involved, even if it it means some compromise because you want to be there and be able to monitor it and be welcome. So I think, um, you know, a, a, um, a situation where a child intractably stays in a relationship that seems objectively, you know, unhealthy or difficult, trying to talk to the child, but also staying there for them, you know, like allowing an estrangement to occur uh, is is not a good thing because it stops any monitoring of the situation. Now, the more common situation where a parent feels that their child could do better or doesn't particularly like uh, the personality of the spouse. So, you know, I've heard many people say, I mean, he's okay, he's a good provider, but I just sort of don't like him, uh, you know, or I think he's a little, you know, shady. I based on the research I've done, you know, kind of interviewing hundreds of people sort of on this topic. If I could put it strongly, I think the parent pretty much needs to suck it up. They, they, it's all, I would say it's such an unsuccessful strategy to try to persistently separate the offspring's partner and sort of draw them back into the family. It's such an unsuccessful strategy that the parent needs to be helped to reconsider it, that they, you know, unless they really want to promote an estrangement. So I think a lot of the issue in that case is on the parent's end. The child is not going to change, let's say, her own preferences and is not going to get a divorce because of the parent. I've spoken to many estranged parents where that's almost their goal is that they hope that like a divorce will occur and the child will come back into the family. And that's just astonishingly unrealistic. So a question is now another question. What can another person in the family do to help overcome a problem like that? You know, I think it's talking. It's keeping the lines of communication open. It's serving as a conduit. Um, one more piece of advice I heard again and again from people who resolved this particular in-law issue. It doesn't sound great, but eventually they said, you handle your family, I'll handle mine. Um, and they begin to develop parallel relationships um, with the in-laws. 
so that couples found it was not a good strategy to insist that the spouse who doesn't get along with the parents come to every family event, come to all the holiday gatherings. Letting separateness actually exist uh, was a strategy, although not an ideal one, that actually worked for a lot of couples. Is you know, you go and enjoy your own family to the extent you can, and the spouse stays out of it. Um, and that actually surprised me, but that came up in a number of relationships. Um, I hope that's helpful. It's a challenging situation. It's one, you know, honestly, that often can only be managed um, rather than resolved. Um, you know, and it may take, uh, from the standpoint of the offspring, some couples counseling to, uh, you know, help them develop strategies. One thing I will say, um, uh, you know, Chase and Sarah, perhaps it's a good, you know, concluding comment. I will say that you see a lot on in chat rooms and on Reddit and on Facebook, people urging uh, other people to go no contact or to, uh, you know, give up on these relationships. And especially with the parent-child relationship, unless, again, it's dangerous, I found in my research it's generally better to maintain some contact, to have grandchildren know who their grandparents are, to be able to have some kind of a relationship is generally psychologically healthier and healthier for families in general. So for all the folks we're talking about, I think it is worth the effort to try to mend your own fractured family and to get help if you need to. Because often people feel a sense of resolution that they don't feel if they go on for decades in a persistent estrangement. So I think in the case you mentioned, I think it's worth it for the offspring to try to some, you know, to come to some kind of compromise that allows these relationships to go on, even if it doesn't involve their spouse. I don't know. Does that relate to your situation at all? Absolutely. Indirectly. It's not my situation. It's actually my mom. And a lot of these things relates. And, you know, one day little Stella is going to have a boyfriend and eventually maybe a husband and hopefully He's amazing and everything she deserves. And, and, but, um, you know, that doesn't always work out perfectly in that sense. So these are valuable things to understand. Yeah. You actually made me think of something like what, you know, so one of the goals of, of this research, which perhaps I should have said at the beginning, one thing which differentiates all the research I did for this study was this focus on going to people who had been able to reconcile and getting their advice. So the goal was to go to people who managed to do this and get their advice and distill it for other people. One of the things they told me about a situation like you said, I'm the father of two daughters. Of course, I have two wonderful partners. Like, so I lucked out for our daughters, but um, we went through some less wonderful ones. One of the arguments they make is lowering expectations and particularly in the area of in-laws. You know, the argument of people who've been through this is that if your in-law relationships are neutral, if they're okay, that's a real success. So for a daughter who marries a guy and comes in expecting that the parents-in-law are going to be the second parents, you know, and they're going to be wonderful, lower those expectations to one that if this is not conflictual, and is not difficult. That's definitely acceptable because in-law relationships so often are. So I think for for someone, you know, like for a parent whose kid is dating, you know, lowering the expectation from perfect match to not harmful match can really ease some anxiety, if that makes any sense. Well, Carl, that is a great place for us to wrap up on. And We've covered a lot and you've given myself and Sarah and our listeners a lot of great tools to apply to their lives to improve their family connections, personal lives, and relationship with their partners. So thank you so much for that. Let's wrap up by having you tell our listeners where they can find you online and then we'll say goodbye. 
Uh, the easiest place is to go to carlpillemer.com, K-A-R-L-P-I-L-L-E-M-E-R.com, or simply Google that. Uh, and you'll find information on both uh, this book and my two prior books. Uh, for more information specifically on estrangement, uh, if you search for the Cornell Reconciliation Project, you'll come specifically to our Estrangement and Reconciliation Research site, which also allows people to tell their own stories uh, and look at some real life stories of other people. Wonderful. Well, we'll have the links uh, to all those resources in the show notes and on our website at idpodcast.com. And thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Well, uh, thanks so much and good luck in all the work you're doing. It's certainly needed. Thanks so much for tuning in to today's show, guys. As always, the links will be in the podcast description as well as on the show notes on our website at idopodcast.com. And while you're on our website, we hope you guys check out our free 14-day happy couple challenge. Uh, it's a challenge where we send you a daily email for 14 days with easy, doable challenges to help strengthen and improve your relationship. And it's honestly just a whole lot of fun to do with your partner. It's something new and we think you guys will really enjoy it. So check it out. And while you're on the website, there are tons of free resources as well as more information about our online course, Spark My Relationship, where our listeners can get $100 off. So check that out. You can go directly to the course website at sparkmyrelationship.com slash unlock. And that's where you can get the $100 off. So thank you guys for tuning in and we'll see you next week.